in my opinion, the only current shotgun on earth that may be able to produce a shooting resume to tackle the great George Digweed as a true shotgun all-rounder is America's Derek Mine. In 2015 in the UAE, he collected the biggest prize ever offered in shooting, $200,000 US dollars for winning the Nad Al Sheba Sporting Tournament. He has since collected two world sporting titles, both in English and in FITAS. He recently tied third in the prestigious Grand America's High All-Around title and next year in IWSF he will become an Olympian for the first time at the delayed Tokyo Olympics. I'm told he holds his own in American Skeet and Hellas also. Let's find out what makes Derek mine tick. Really appreciate your time today. Uh, thanks for t making time for us. Uh, glad to be here. Now, the hardest part I've got with you, Derek, is that most people, when I introduce them, I say, and here we have John Smith, sporting clay shooter. But with Derek Mine, I've got a problem because when I first met you, you were an Olympic trap shooter at the Sydney World Cup in 2012. But then only just a short time ago, a few weeks ago, um, at the Grand American Trap Tournament, you finished third in the high all around. And for 99% of the people in the world, if you finish third or in the high all around, you're considered an American trap shooter. But then of course, we look at you a bit deeper and you've got two world sporting championships to your name already. And anyone that ever wins a world sporting championship is considered to be a sporting shooter. So Derek, tell us, what are you? <laughs> I'm just a guy that loves to shoot. And uh, I've been very blessed that, uh, my skill sets carried across a broad range of, of disciplines. And I, like I said, I, I just enjoy shooting and I enjoy competing. And a clay target is a clay target. If it's in the air, I want to break it. Well, that's a very modest answer. But tell me, what do 99% of the people that you meet categorize you as? You're an Olympian. Uh, I, I'll guarantee you this. I'll guarantee you this. When you go to Tokyo next year, you will be the only person ever to shoot in the Olympic Games track competition that would have been considered at some stage in their life a sporting shooter because they, they just aren't. And then there's nobody there that I've ever seen. And I went to six to, to be able to judge that. But I've seen a few in double trap, but never have I seen an Olympic trap shooter that may have been considered a sporting shooter. I do not choose skeet. Because there's too many good American skeet shooters. <laughs> So tell, tell us, Jerry, what do people class you as? Um, most people would consider me a sporting shooter. Uh, I started shooting sporting clays in 1994 um, as a young kid, and that's what I shot most of my life. Okay, I want to I want to go back to your early days. Then your father, Rick, um, a hell of a shooter. Um, it, it, am I right to say he's the first person ever at his first attempt off 27 yards to hit 100 straight? To, yes, uh, to my knowledge, he's still the only one to have ever accomplished that. Was he an American trap shooter? Did he class? Because he, I, I know at Hellas he was very good, but did, was he classed as an American trap shooter first? No, uh, he started shooting sporting clays not long before I did, and uh, I, I think we'd shot sporting clays for three or four years before we ever went to an American trap tournament. Um, which do you find the easiest? And this is going to upset a lot of people, your answer here, but out of all the disciplines that you've shot, what do you consider you have to put the least amount of work into to get the best result? I, that's a hard answer because they're all, they're all a challenge in their own way. And um, as far as probably the least effort to break a quality score, I'd have to say American Ski. Ah. It, ah. You've gone way up in my estimation now. Oh, jeez. Great. Thanks. Actually, we're, we're going to get rid of that part. <laughs> um, we'll bleep that out. Um, just, you know, on that, um, I, I noticed you do a lot of coaching. And, you know, is the majority of the coaching that you're doing in sporting? Uh, most of it's been in sporting place. Uh, this year, I have had... Uh, Quite a few people contact me about uh, international trap lessons. How many guns do you use in all the disciplines that you shoot? I have to say the proof in the pudding with the, my Kohler Max Light that I've been shooting for the last five years. Everything I've ever won has been with that gun, and it's been the same setup. So you everything. use the same setup at shooting 27 yards American trap as you do at shooting bunker or Olympic trap as you do shooting American skeet, because I know you're on your way to the World Skeet Championship. 
Um, so you use the same setup. Can, can you describe your gun to us? Because that's a fascinating answer. My gun is uh, what Kohler calls a ramp fixed tapered rib. Um, it's uh, probably three sixteenths, not quite a quarter inch, um, so like three three millimeters maybe, roughly maybe four of a little bit of a ramp and then tapers back down to the rib. Um, and I shoot a pretty close to parallel comb stock um, with, very, with very little Monte Carlo in it. How high is the gun uh, shooting, uh, Derek? Does it shoot semi um, high? Does it shoot flat? Uh, the, the barrels, if I have the beads perfectly in line, shoot 50-50. But I've got my comb height set up where I've got a gap in the beads. So if you put so, it on a pattern plate at 25 metres or 25 yards, is it shooting dead flat at, at when you mount the gun, 50-50? Um, it's probably shooting up a little bit, but I've trained myself to look over the top of a gun instead of on what I would feel like is a true 50-50 look. So the spot that I'm looking at, the gun hits. And, and chokes? Uh, I'm using Pure Gold Chokes, the Champion Series. They're a titanium ported choke tube. Um, I shoot uh, a lot of modified when I'm shooting sporting clays, but I do uh, do change for close targets. Or if they get a long ways out there, I'll put in an improved modified. And then in Olympic trap, I shoot uh, improved modified and full. And in skeet, do you use actual skeet chokes <laughs> or do you give the others a chance and put some full chokes in for them? Uh, I'm going to shoot my skeet chokes. But my, uh, my skeet chokes pattern a little tight. Um, so with sporting, of course, there's so many different methods and it's interesting being able to speak to someone who is so good at so many different disciplines. When you're shooting sporting, do you shoot a mixture of sustained lead, you know, pull away, pass through? And are they things that you teach to your students as well? So um, I don't rely on one method. Um, I lean more towards a hybrid between maintain lead and pull away, mm -hmm. uh, meaning I insert somewhere in front of the target and then pull away to break the target. Um, but it's a very small pull away. Uh, try and keep things as close to the speed of the target as I can. Um, you know, when, I'm not afraid if I get beat by a target to swing through it. Um, if I insert too far in front, I can maintain it. You know, it, it's not, my, my style is more geared around my vision and using visual focus on the target and Connect it, getting connected and matching the speed than it is any anything else. Derek, I want to talk to you about your breakout event and don't take this the wrong way because I know you've said already you've been shooting since 1994, but most of the world didn't hear about Derek Mine until the 2015 at Al Sheba event in the United Arab Emirates where you won that event in very difficult targets, I believe. Um, there were still people crying on the internet about how hard they were, but you won the world's biggest prize in shooting, um, 200,000 US dollars, which is a, a hell of a prize. First of all, the first question, did you tell your wife how much you won? She was there with me. Oh, rookie <laughs> error, Derek, rookie <laughs> error. <laughs> you know, in, in, in my defense, she shot as well, and she shot good enough to get in the lady's purse. Oh, wow. So she, she covered her own expenses. So before so. you went out, did you two make a pact you were going to split the money between the two of you? Uh, er everything we had at that point was already split anyway. Is that how you met? Um, we, we met uh, in college. She joined the shooting team at Kansas State University um, as a freshman. And I was still at Lindenwood University at the time when we met. Then I transferred to Kansas State and the rest is history. So. <laughs> well, you made your name in that event, I guess, for a lot of people in the world because it got a lot of publicity. But then you really showed people how you could shoot by winning the following year. You won the World Fetas Championship and you've since won one of the um, World English Sporting Championships. I want to ask you a hypothetical question and I'll give you the tip that I've asked this question last night to George Digweed. So I want to ask you just an honest answer. If, if we were to run a competition in, let's say, Italy, and we got a heap of French guys to set the ground in a FITAS style competition, and you got to pick the top 10 United States FITAS shooters, and George picked the top 10 British FITAS shooters, and assuming you are both in the team, who'd win? I think the US, hands down. 
<laughs> it's come a long way. I'll grant you if I asked you that question 20 years ago, you may not have said that. But why do you right. think the US has progressed so much? Um, I think a, a lot of it had to do with with growing as in the sport. You know, um, England's, I hate to say how many years ahead of us in the game of sporting clays they are on the on the learning curve. But that was what always held us back for so long. We've always had very capable shooters. They just hadn't learned how to win at the biggest levels in sporting clays is what I always felt like. And, um, you know, once we started with the PSCA, that, that pushed us to another level competitively, you know, week in, week out, really button heads, making each other better. And, uh, and so I feel like that's given us a very deep field that uh, is always pushing us to be better. Well, the PSCA didn't survive. Um, can you see it reemerging? You know, I, I hold out hope that it will. Um, I, I love the format. I love shooting head to head in front of people. Um, that was, I always enjoyed that. But, uh, you know, I, I don't, it'll take a special set of circumstances, I think, for it to come back. Yeah, so it's interesting Russell mentioned that, you know, you won that big amount of money and we know that there's a lot of money available in sporting shoots, you know, through, um, you know, opportunities. But with um, your transition to trap, was it difficult not having that same level of financial reward? There was a little bit of that. Um, but, you know, when you, when you go to looking at the Olympic events, um, you're, you're not looking at the financial side of it. You're looking at the prestige of being an Olympian and having the opportunity to win an Olympic medal um, that so few people have, have that opportunity. And uh, that, that for me is the driving force behind shooting the Olympic trap. Well, you went to the Olympic trials and you won them hands down. You won them easily in the end. Um, I think Brian Burroughs is your partner for Tokyo. Yeah. Um, and don't take this the wrong way either, but no one knows you for being an Olympic trap shooter and I'm sure you're about to change that. But um, would you give up your two world sporting titles for an Olympic gold medal? That, that's a tough one. Um, I, I'm not sure I'd give up anything to win something else, but that would definitely be pretty tempting. You know, there certainly wouldn't be any, anything more prestigious to win with a shotgun in your hands, that's for sure. Do you find it hard to train for Olympic trap? For, for, for sporting, I guess, if you're having trouble with a particular type of target, whether it's a springing teal or whatever, you, you're going to sit there until you've worked it out. But in Olympic trap, the demons are in your head and there wouldn't be one particular target I think you'd struggle with. But tell us how you train for Olympic trap. Do you just do rounds of 25 or do you do station work or how do you do it? I, I do a lot of of known target practice, forcing myself to get a good look at the target, um, per running my routine on known targets. It, so I'm eliminating that chance for panic that sets in. You know, you've shot it enough to, to know that most people miss a, a, an Olympic trap target because they panic and, and rush everything. So by training known targets, I feel like I'm, I'm eliminating that so I can focus on my basic fundamentals and make sure they're perfect which when I go into shooting rounds, to me, helps eliminate that panic. Are you starting the gun on the top of the roof, above the roof? And where, where are your eyes in Olympic trap? It's the question I get asked more than anything. I adjust my whole point based on where I'm shooting and how I'm seeing. Um, but I always keep my gun and my eyes together. I don't ever separate them. So you, some days you are well above the trap and other days you're down as low as the lip of the trap house? Yeah. Yeah, that take much to get used to. There, there aren't many people I would say that would do that or have the ability to do it. So take that as a compliment. But how far above are you talking? Not, not parallel or anything that high, are you? No, um, the highest I've ever held is about the ten meter mark. Um, yeah. I mean that's up. That's pretty high. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, I mean, when I was doing that, I was looking down through the gun at the lip of the house. Um, I've since evolved my game since those days and now I'm usually somewhere you know maybe half to a meter above the mark with my gun in my eyes depending on where I'm at 
as a shooter, we all know that using a good pre-shot routine is a really good idea. And the more consistent you can be in that process, the better it will be for you. Do you use a similar pre-shot routine for sporting and trap? I do. Um, my trap routine is a lot longer than my sporting routine. Um, my sporting routine is for the initial pair at a station is probably as long as my routine is for one target on, on Olympic trap. But each pair after that, it, it's a little quicker. Now, we mentioned George Digweed, and George is famous for many things, but one thing that uh, I think a lot of people will remember George for when he finally retires is the fact that in the World All-Round Championship, the World All-Round Shotgun Championship, George was pretty much invincible at it. I think even you competed against him in, in at least one of those. If they had that event today, though... Um, I bet you'd give him a fair run for his money. How did you go when you actually shot in that event against George? So bo both years, if you throw out the, the three sporting events, VTAS, Five Stand, and, and American Sporting, or English Sporting, um, if you throw out those three events, I was pretty neck and neck with George. Um, but at the time, I, I hadn't developed my game as strong in sporting clays as what, uh, what it is now. Um, and probably the reason I shot the other events good is because at that time I was still shooting at uh, the collegiate level, which we shot a little bit of everything. I, uh, I won the 2008 <coughs> collegiate National championship. Um, and I, my score that year is the highest score out of the, the 400 targets ever. Which was what? How many? Uh, 388 out of 400. Do you remember the ones you missed? Yeah. <laughs> um, I missed, uh, believe it or not, I missed, uh, I think I had a 94 in modified Olympic trap, um, which is they sped up a, an ATA and turned it to full wobble up and down and side to side. Mm -hmm. And then I think I shot a 90, maybe I had a 389. I had a 96, I think, in international skeet. And then I had a 99 in American trap and 100 in American skeet. Do you think they'll ever run the world all round championship again? I think somebody will, you know, it's, it, at least here, there's always a debate, um, you know, who's, who's the better group of shooters. And, you know, I, I wish we could get more disciplines to field shooters in the event. Um, unfortunately, I feel like every time the events have been hosted, it has definitely been weighed heavy on the sporting clay side. And, uh, and I think that has unfortunately scared shooters away. Um, I want to touch back on an issue in sporting clays, and I certainly don't want you to mention individuals in it, but one of the problems that we've had, even here in Australia, and I know you've had it in the United States, and I know it's happened in, in Great Britain, is that there, there is a, an issue with a lot of people that sporting clays isn't inviting because people are known to cheat at it, and it's not... It's not an issue that people want to talk about. And, and again, I don't want to talk about individuals in it, but how do we combat that, Derek? Because it, it is alive and well. I read the social media in the United States. Every, every week there's someone complaining about it. So it's happening over there. What can they do to get on top of it? Because in Olympic trap, you've never seen it. You've never seen anyone cheat ever. But why do they do it in sporting clothes? Um, I, I can't attest as to why they do it. Um, other than they feel like they're gaining something out of it. Um, I think the, the only way we can combat it is for the guys that are at the top of the game to, uh, to step forward and, and start self-policing and making sure that we're all playing on an honest playing field amongst ourselves, and hopefully that will carry down throughout the, the ranks of shooters. Is it refereeing? Do we need better referees? Does it does – it get to the point where you need a paid referee, but of course that increases the cost of the entry fee. But would people be willing to pay more to have a professional referee that wouldn't be bullied? You know, they, it, in, fee, in fee task, they have uh, very highly qualified referees. And I don't, I don't see that cheating's as bad there. And you know, it could be, but um, I think what helps as much as anything is when you go to the fee task world championship, it's random squatting. So you're not squatted with your buddies and you don't have the backing of your friends. You know, if you're trying to, call, if somebody's trying to call pieces or anything like that. So I, I feel like going more to a random squatting like you have in the Olympic events or at the world feet task 
um, would probably help as much as anything. Speaking of teams around you, I know you're an advocate for a good team. Um, um, who do you feel has your, been your biggest support in your current journey? Uh, definitely my wife. Um, she's the one that encouraged me, I guess, uh, about six years ago now to, uh, to pursue being a professional shooter and, uh, and revolve our life around the game. And she's been my number one support and rock and, and push me in, uh, in this chase of the Olympic dream. Fantastic. Why don't you show me that sort of support? <laughs> Thanks, Derek. <laughs> Thanks. <Mike. laughs> he, he's worried about you whooping up on him. That's why. <laughs> now, Derek, you're, you're, uh, we've mentioned it already, but you're part of the Tokyo Olympic team for the United States. But it's been a long time since the United States has even had a representative in the trap competition, which is amazing. When you consider the history of the United States, particularly in skeet, but you've had two Olympics now where no one's even made the team. Um, yeah. Did the United States feel the pressure this time to at least qualify? Because, you know, they oh, made a meal of it before that. That, that. that was all that was talked about for the last three years at, uh, at our trial events. And um, that's, that's what everyone was focused on, was making sure we win a quota spot. And, um, you know, not to knock Glenn, but I think that was some of the added pressure that he felt in the finals at both the world championships and at the cat games when he kind of faltered in the finals. Um, you know, I think that additional pressure at the time, you know, I was just starting to get my feet under me as a competitor in Olympic trap here in the U S and uh, so I think he pro he might've felt the pressure of him being the one to carry that torch and, and get the job done. Were you ever tempted to join the army and join the marksmanship unit? Um, I, I'd had an opportunity right out of college. Um, I don't think it was right for me. Um, just, I, uh, I enjoy shooting other stuff too much. I think to be focused on one ex exclusive event. So now that you're in the Olympic team, the COVID crisis hits the world. So they take away every World Cup for you to prepare in. And looking at next year, uh, I don't even think there's a World Cup scheduled before the Olympic Games at this stage. How are you going to prepare for Tokyo? Um, first off, when, uh, when things got postponed, I was actually kind of relieved because our trial process is so grueling. You know, you basically have to have your brain switched on into competitive mode for almost six months. Um, you can't let yourself rest over the winter time. And so that fatigue, I, I was kind of glad that I got the break and was able to shut down. Um, I feel like it allowed me to refresh. But uh, as far as getting ready for next year, um, I'm going to try and shoot any competition I can get my hands on, you know, whether that be sporting or, uh, or ISSF events, if they have them. Um, or, you know, maybe try and, uh, try and go over to Europe and, and shoot some of the Grand Prix or something. Um, the fact that you're, you're playing, and I don't know you told me this just recently, your plan is to go and shoot the World American Skeet Championship. That event yeah. is still on at this stage. Yeah, uh, as of right now, it's, they're still planning on holding it. Hope you don't miss. <laughs> You've got a bit it's of so pressure. easy. It's so easy. Well, you know, I... Uh, the only, the only thing that really scares me is 410, um, you know, because you can do everything right with a 410 and still miss. So Very unforgiving. Very. Who is um, coaching you at Olympic Trap? Have you had someone to help you along the way? And then the second part of that question, where are you shooting your Olympic Trap? So I've been working with Lance Bade. Um, um, he's really helped me uh, hone my skills. And uh, as crazy as it sounds, what I've worked on with him on Olympic trap has actually improved my sporting game. I feel like. Well, Lance um, was a very good all round shooter himself. He was just as good in my opinion at double trap as he was at Olympic trap. So he, he knows the mechanics of the game, but where are you yeah. shooting? Where, where, where's your nearest range? So the closest Olympic trap field to me is a three and a half hour drive one way. Wow. wow. So I hop on a plane and go to Colorado and train at the Olympic Training Center, or I've been going down um, some to the uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and shooting with the Army guys. Um, and then uh, Dwayne Weger's place is—he's uh, about as easy for me to get to as anybody. 
Well, that's probably one of the prettiest little ranges you'd ever go to. Well, there's a record I bet you have also at the Tokyo Olympics. You live the furthest from your training venue. I bet you've already won a gold medal in that or straight away. Yeah. So I, I did put in a, a wobble trap in my backyard. Um, to is, that kind of, is, is that the same? No, not really. Um, it, it works fine for the training known targets like I talked about before. Um, but, and, and you can run your routine, but that's really about all that I feel like I, I get out of it. Well, I noticed you do travel a lot for work. Um, and obviously with competing and now it sounds like even just for training. So, um, you must do a lot of miles. Do you get sick of it? Sometimes, you know, it, it's not so much sick of the travel or sick of the competing and stuff like that as much as it is just being homesick and missing my family. Does she travel with you to a lot of these competitions? Yeah, so we have a uh, we've got a horse trailer with living quarters that we haul take to a lot of the sporting shoots, and uh, my wife can work remotely, so they travel with us, and and that works out pretty good. Um, yeah, kind of a funny story with her. So I got her a, a Red Rider BB gun for her birthday this year, and uh, took it out, and she shot it a couple times, and. We go inside and she walks right up to my dad and goes, Papa, I'm already a good shooter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> God bless her. Um, we have a lot of people uh, that will watch this interview, Derek, and want to know some more of the technical things. I'm just curious on the ammunition that you're using. First of all, an Olympic trap. Um, velocity and shot size. Uh, I'm shooting uh, 1350 feet per second. And uh, shooting eights, both barrels. But eights in the second barrel as well. Even on some yeah. of the harder clay targets that you might find in Europe, and, and some of them are hard, do you find the eights are okay? Um, I, in sporting clays, I will put in seven and a halves for targets that are 45, 50 yards and out. But nothing um, ever bigger than that? No. No. And, and you know, I, I look at it as an American seven and a half, so that's – like a European seven. Will you pursue the Olympic dream um, to Paris or is this a once only thing for Derek Mine? Is this something else you want to do? I wasn't sure when I started uh, the, our actual Olympic trials, whether or not I wanted to do it again. But after making the team, I'm pretty certain that I'm going to at least give it one more run. Um, if not, try and make it two more for the uh, LA, LA games. It's very addictive, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, it is, it's, uh, you know, it, it's definitely the most stressful thing I've ever done with a shotgun. Um, but uh, it definitely is addictive. I look forward to watching your journey now. And, uh, it, it's been a great journey so far. And part of this, this series were for people that not only have influenced it in the past, but I believe that are going to influence the sport in the next decade. And you're right at the top of that list because I don't know from one year to the next where I'm going to read your name and in what event. And I'm pretty sure you don't know either. You're just going to try for them all. And there aren't too many people out there that can sincerely say they're a chance to win them all. But I think you're with, you're the one. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I appreciate that uh, vote of confidence. Um, you know, I, uh, like I said, I, I enjoy shooting. And uh, part of my reason for shooting everything is I, I got sick and tired of people talking about who's the best, you know, which disciplines are the best. And I thought it was time for somebody to go shoot a little bit of everything and, and show that you don't have to focus on one event. You can shoot them all and be successful. It's very incredible record. Yeah, from now on, you'll be known as Derek Mine Shooter, <laughs> not Derek Mine Sporting Clay Shooter. Or let, you'll just be Shooter. I, I, I can only hope that I'll be remembered as a shooter and not a, not a discipline shooter. When you were talking about um, a sporting shooter making the Olympics, um, there is one guy, actually two, one of them shot skeet, one of them shot trap, that have both won NSCA National Sporting Clays titles. And have won Olympic gold. What a world title, though. You'd have to be the only one. You don't have to be the only world champion. Who, who, who are you talking about? Danny Carlisle? Dan Carlisle and Matt Drake. Mm. Yeah, uh, we spoke about both of them in the Vincent Hancock interview. Um, and 
I did, uh, as you're probably aware, um, I did a book quite a few years back now, six years ago, about the world's top 20 shotgunners that I've met. And I left Danny out. I wrote a story about Danny, but I just couldn't put him in. There wasn't enough room in the book. And I wrote a story about Vincent Hancock, which I had to apologise um, because I didn't include Vincent either because I was sort of hoping Vincent would just go away and we'd never hear any more of him. And then he won another <laughs> handful of world titles. Um, Danny Carlisle and Matt Trike were amazing shooters. I included Matt in it, even though Matt's record wasn't anywhere near what Vincent Hancock's was back in 2014. But he changed the sport of skeet shooting. And I know he could shoot sporting clays and he was very good on the other things that come out of boxes over there. But yeah. there's only a list of 20. And the trouble is I've got now, I'm getting a lot of pressure to rewrite it and I'm going to have to do a story on you. And I hadn't done a story on you in 2014, but you'd absolutely make the list now because I was really keen for people that were all round shooters to make that list. And they had to have done something outside of one discipline pretty much to do it, even though Wayne Mays made the list and he'd only ever really won things in American skeet, but he'd also achieved the Grand Slam in the ATA. Um, but yeah. Shan Zhang was the 20th person. But, you know, here's a woman that's thrust in from China and wins an overall championship at the Olympics. How do you not include her in the book? But yeah. sadly, if I rewrite the book, she probably won't make it because people <laughs> like you have ruined it. <laughs> I also think it's quite normal for international skate shooters to, for, for sporting shooters to cross over into international skate, I think because of the amount and, you know, sort of just the natural... Um, progression, um, whereas it's more unusual to see sporting shooters choosing trap. Yeah, you know, for for me, I felt like um, I probably could have shot international skeet fairly competitive, yeah. um, but having shot, like you know, I shot trap uh, and I missed the fin U.S. finals for the 08 Olympic team by one target, mm -hmm. and so I had shot some Olympic trap in the past, and I felt like with the competitors we had in the U S it was in trap. It was beating two or three guys. Whereas in ski to be beaten six or seven. That's maybe why eight. I had to move to Australia. <laughs> I couldn't get in the women's ski team anymore. <laughs> well, there's no doubt on earth. The hardest team to make is the U S women's Olympic ski team. It was, uh, it, it's sad to say, but Kim, Kim was fighting an uphill battle at the start of that trials. I mean, it's uh, unbelievable. You know, you basically got, five that at any given day could be number one skeet shooter in the world. Derek, I want to ask you about the selection policy of the United States. If we look at the world powerhouse in IWSF shooting in history, it's been the Italian team and they hand select their teams. There's no trials. They just say, I want this person because he shoots good on that range and I'm going to take that person. The US picks their team over a lot of targets, but it's fair. It's first past the post, whoever hits the most. Which is the better policy to win an Olympic gold medal, the Italians or the United States? Um, you know, I, I'd i have to say the Italians haven't gotten it wrong. You know, they've won, a, won an awful lot of Olympic medals in the shooting sports. And I would have to say that that's probably because once someone gets, you know, to a point where they're going, they get to keep going. Whereas in the U.S., you're, you're constantly having to, switch focus from an ISSF event back to our U S trials, which is such a broader spectrum of targets that it's a completely different mentality in my mind. Um, to make to say, Derek, it might be fair to say though, if the U S used the Italian system, you might not be going to the Olympic games. There's a very good chance um, that I wouldn't be. Um, you know, it, interesting. It, um, I asked this question of Vincent Hancock, as you've probably seen on his interview by now, and Vincent said he's on the ethics and fairness, I think the committee they call it. Um, he missed out on the 2019 World Championships at Lenato, which he's never shot a bad event in his life, but he had to watch the World Championships without him, and he won two World Cups that year. If he was an Italian, there is no chance ever that he wouldn't have been selected for that team. But he agreed with you that, OK, um, it, it might be better the American system, but it might not be best. It's fairer. Right. It's a tough question, I know, but hey, yeah, let's, it, let's, let's be grateful they didn't pick it that way. Right. You know, it, it's, I, I'm definitely, definitely fortunate that I had the opportunity being in open trials to, uh, to make the team. Um, 
but you know, at the same time, I think uh, a lot of people have misunderstood that I didn't just show up and shoot the Olympic trials. I've really worked at it the last almost four years now, made a couple teams so I could go to World Cups, get my MQS, and uh, and try and help the team win a quota spot. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't that far off from being one of the two guys to, to go to the Pan American Games. Um, yeah, you were, you're an overnight sensation 10 years in the making. That's what's happened. Yeah. <laughs> if you had a, ch a young child come to you or someone that was really interested in pursuing the sport at Olympic level, um, how many year plan would you tell them it would take to get to the Olympics? Well, going off my plan, it was 25 years. <laughs> it's a lot of work, isn't it? No, you know, it, it's, it, it's at least a 10 year process. You know, it, it's, it's going to take you seven to eight years to learn how to win enough just to make a team in my, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, I took some of my winning experience from sporting clays and was able to apply that to Olympic trap. But, um, you know, without that experience, then, you know, who, it, I probably wouldn't be where I am. Derek, we've turned this 20 minute interview <laughs> into a 40 minute interview and it's been, it's been fascinating listening to one of the world's greatest all round shooters. Thanks for your time today. And uh, we wish you all the best in your journey from Tokyo, I guess, to Paris and maybe to LA and wherever the world takes you, I'm sure that you'll be competitive. Well, I, I certainly enjoyed it and I'd be open to doing a longer interview if you ever want to. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Derek. All the best. Thanks. You too.